give as an example uh, the 26-11 incident in Bombay of the terrorist attack on the Taj what made what made uh, those employees uh, risk their lives in some cases to shelter to shelter the people who were dining at the Taj, the people who were staying at the Taj. There was no manual, there was no uh, instruction, there was no training. What happened and how did individuals, it was the spirit of the organization that made that happen. There was no message that went out. People thought of uh, what to do to switch off lights in a restaurant to make everybody lie down, keep quiet, move them out through the kitchen. What made that happen? I can't say that I did anything or that the management did anything. It happened. And to not recognize that terrific spirit that took place, that was embodied in individuals, some of them lost their lives, in in doing so, I I think it gives an imp an impression of what can take place. I I had the fortune or misfortune of being in Jamshedpur as a very young person when there was a communal riot that took place. It in three days killed about four hundred or five hundred people, and it all started by somebody r running around the plant saying. Oh, come and see the trains that are coming from Kashmir. The, the people have been disfigured, etc. By the evening, the first stabbing took place. By the end of two days, the army had to be called in. I don't know how many crane operators I took out of the plant in the trunk of my car because uh, there were people waiting for them down when they came down off their shift to kill them. And a horrible thing took place in four days. Uh, was that a negative spirit? I think it was incited by, again, the spark, the wrong kind of spark uh, being ignited and the community responding to that wrong spark. So. The two different examples of how spirit overtakes uh, a situation when when it happens. So, I, listening to myself speaking just now, I'm saying that the importance is the spark that you create. As you are aware, we created a trust to deal with all the victims, whether they were from the Taj or or not. Um, and we have used that fund to, not to rebuild ourselves, but to, to try to rebuild the lives of some of the, we paid their hospital bills, we have, some, some are really touching cases because I remember, I used to go in the evenings to Bombay Hospital where many of these uh, victims were recovering. I distinctly remember one of them was a lady in a coma who had lost her entire family when she came out of the coma, which was several months later. She realized that she didn't have a family any longer. And uh, no one was there to pay her a hospital bill. We we paid it out of this trust, and there are many cases like that. And I, somewhat pain to say that, as citizens, we just walked away from that situation. the The event was over. We walked away. There were hundreds of people that 
were killed at the railway station that we have tried to help where they have where the cases have come up. There was a a uh, policeman who was in the hospital with, who was shot because he didn't have a weapon that could match that of the terrorists. So all these things, someone should sit together and talk about what would happen if, God forbid, such a thing happened again. And I'm, I'm afraid the blunt answer is that we're still not prepared. Uh, being prepared is one thing. Do we have compassion lighting candles on in front of the gateway of India as citizens is symbolic? Have we shared in the in the anguish that a few people have had that the people that were really suffered? And I I don't think we've displayed that that, that kind of compassion. Elon has been a tremendous innovator, but he's a personal innovator. I attended a meeting in, in which is housed in his SpaceX uh, facility. And during the break, he said, you want to come and see what we're doing? And I said, yes, sir. So we went down to the shop floor. And uh, I said, where do you get your rocket engine? He said, we make our own. And he said, we're putting this vehicle that has unmanned vehicle, which has gone to the space station. You know, we're making our vehicle myself. So I thought this guy is really trying to pull wool over. I'm using good <laughs> language in your presence. Uh, the, in a very typical Indian way, He's putting his label on something that someone else has done. And as we walked through the shop floor, I really came to conclude this guy is really building his rocket engines himself. He's really building his vehicles, which will take seven human beings to the space station himself. And I suddenly thought to myself, and he was doing it at twice the speed of NASA and about one-tenth of the cost of NASA. And I thought, is this really possible? That this guy who has come into uh, his wealth is going into such a risky business and is doing able to do this and do it at such a difference from a monopoly situation that has happened, funded by the federal government to this extent? And the answer is yes. The person who, who developed uh, a software package, sold it, under, then undertook to produce an electric car and build it to an image of leadership in this electric car area then into space, and now into various and sundry other areas. How does that person do it? I think we can assume that he doesn't do it alone. He does it because he's able to, produce, to develop a team around him that, that doesn't uh, say things cannot be done, but have the attitude of saying, how do we do it? That's what we want to do. How do we do it? And whether you write it on the wall or write on the floor or you wear shoes or don't wear shoes or you have a beard or long hair or have... <laughs> that happens. I didn't say you, it. You don't choose it. It just happens. <laughs> You don't do the beard, it just happens. It just <laughs> so, I think these are issues that you foster that environment. And you don't worry about, about uh, whether you conform. Mm -hmm. 
Mahatma Gandhi said once that if between you and the other person, if one of us has to lose face, let it be you, not the other person. You represent that for me in many ways, hearing you now and also since yesterday evening. So can you share with us, keeping your usual self-effacing nature aside and candidly share with us a moment or an event in your life which shows you in this light? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I would pick another instance. When I was uh, chairman of Telco at that time, with Tata Motors today, we traditionally was a, were a truck company producing commercial vehicles. Somewhere in the 80s, I took a view that we should stop being merely a commercial vehicle company and enter the car market. Most people f have forgotten that Telco or Tata Motors, as it is now called, decided to make an Indian car. It, not the Nano, it was a car called the Indica. Uh, so, it called for uh, faith and confidence in your engineers that you could actually do something from scratch, that you could compete in the marketplace, which was new but was opening up. That you could do something without going through a life of license manufacture, collaborations, etc. And you could undertake to do this as an Indian company. So all my friends in the car industry overseas said, you know, you, you're, you're younger than we are and you're more ambitious, but people have done this and failed. It's just not the thing to do. Uh, the board went along, but reluctantly. My Indian friends, not in the car industry, as we progressed down this journey, started to distance themselves from me because it, they distanced themselves from failure. <laughs> And when the car was launched, uh, it attracted attention, but uh, people were looking for its weak points, etc., rather than its strengths. If you, however, so uh, in a way, one had to lose face in the sense that here was impending disaster. Uh, you believed in these people, you were, you were under this spotlight, not your people. And uh, yet, that, yet that car gained a 20% market share in the industry and continues to exist today. By contrast, the Nano, which is another challenge, one might say you would achieve the challenge of producing a low-cost car, but the company did many things wrong in promoting the car or marketing the car. There might be an issue of a loss of face. How does one face that loss of face? I think, again, in the inner voice saying, did you do the right thing? Did you produce a car for a lack? If it had gone right, did you cover new ground? And the inner sense of that is, yes, you did. You did something wrong. You, the major thing that one did wrong, I think, is handing it back to the traditional marketing people or salespeople who decided to try to sell it the same way as you sold any car. The car was de devised to give people on two-wheelers an alternative, safer, affordable form of family transport, not to produce the cheapest car. It was to upgrade people's lifestyle into four wheels rather than two, 
into a safer form of transport, not to move them down into a cheaper car. So we needed to market the car as innovatively as we had chosen to design it. So the inner you know, voice said that you did nothing wrong, something else was wrong, and you should try to rectify that, which unfortunately is still not happening. Then I look with some degree of sadness that what became uh, recognized as an Indian achievement hasn't been as successful in India as it perhaps should be. Maybe one day it may be successful in Indonesia or some other country where it gets uh, marketed. But it's, it's considered to be a dark cloud hanging over one said, I have no, no sense of depression over it because I think we undertook to do something which, which we succeeded in doing. We didn't succeed in commercializing it to the extent that it could. We didn't revolutionize the car industry in India, unfortunately. But I don't consider that loss of face to have been devastating. In your own words, uh, GRD played a significant role in molding you at that time. Considering that uh, you took the mantle when the first steps of liberalization were taken, to what extent was GRD crippled by the policies of that day? You know, it, I think through, through J.R.D.'s life, he took positions, he, some he abided by, uh, the positions he abided by, he accepted he could not change. And he remained um, a dissenter. Part of that was the political environment, part of that was the industrial environment that we were in, an environment of protection which he was opposed to. Uh, and there were others, other areas, uh, very often outside the area of industry, family planning, birth control, which he went and became a, a global voice uh, advocating certain things that needed to happen. I think a group cannot just be driven to be doing the same thing decade after decade. It has to reinvent itself, has to change with changing times. So the, the issue is that you need to sit back and ask, are you relevant in today's world? Are you doing things in a manner that is the best way to do it? It may be for environmental reasons, it may be for health reasons, it may be uh, that you replace manpower with technology, that what, what are you doing and how are you uh, relevant in today's world? In that sense, you have to create an ability to look at your products, processes, your management philosophy, and ask yourself, do you need to change? Or do you need to evolve or do you need to improve. Sometimes improvement can be driven by competition or it could be for other reasons. So you have to create an environment which can be critical of yourself, not misunderstood to be anti-corporate, but an environment that can say that we have been doing this 20, for 20 years and it's time we can do it another way. And you need to create an environment where someone who is 
been doing it for 20 years doesn't slap you down and and say that thanks you've made your point but we'll continue to do it the same way or that we have billions expended in this area as legacy costs which you're going to continue to retain so i felt that uh, the group that was by and large in traditional businesses should create an environment where one felt that the company was more nimble footed and could look at reinventing itself or reinventing its products uh in a in a particular constructive way so i made that one of the uh tenets of what we wanted to do that we had to be innovative some of my colleagues uh went about that by deciding they would create a manual of innovation i really don't believe that that <laughs> that's the way to innovate that's just in my view a contradiction the innovation should come as part of an environment i think where we're sitting today is innovation we're expressing views in a manner that may not normally happen we're doing it in an environment that where different people have come together that in, in a manner of speaking is innovation that you're looking at things you're opening yourself up to i think as uh guru has mentioned if you can't you know control what you do yourself how are you going to control others so i think companies have to uh destroy or demolish barriers that take place that this is the way we do things and we should be open to the smallest and the most seemingly irrelevant issues which foster change and when you innovate you ought not to be innovating for the sake of saying that you're innovating on that on page 3 item 7c said this and that you did that because that's not innovation that's uh, that's following a doctrine and there is no doctrine for innovation other than the fact that you're open so there is one aspect which is seeking excellence in the systematic excellence tata business excellence model or whatever this in in pursuit of systemic excellence does does it curb individual genius somewhere because being so big on innovation you need a spark of genius here and there so systemic excellence definitely makes friction free function but at the same time it could become too sedate and there's no spark of genius there's a very famous situation when henry ford uh, was wanting to saw that there is not enough uh, excellence or efficiency in the system he hired an efficiency expert who was given total freedom to go and change things and fire people that he has to fire without even asking henry so he was going about firing and hiring things and coming and uh, then he came back to henry one day and said there's one guy who whenever i enter his office he's got his both his legs up on the table he's smoking a cigar i've never seen him doing any work and people say i cannot fire him so henry asked who is this guy so he mentioned the name then henry said don't fire him the last time he had his boots on the table and he was smoking cigar he came up with a billion dollar idea don't touch him <laughs> so how do you manage between this pursuit of excellence and efficiency versus individual genius i visited the toyota plant in bangalore and on the shop floor there is a walkway there is a pathway you have to walk only on that yeah. and when you want to if you want to turn right first you said this this and then you said this yeah. and you turn every time yeah and uh, okay it, it, and every time you go down a staircase you must hold the railing if you don't hold the railing you're made to go up and again come back again i'm saying wanting to systematize like this it definitely curbs genius so how do you balance between these two 
I think if you if you uh, systematize to the extent that you just described, it's very difficult to also have a balance to innovation because you keep going up and climbing down the stairs again, holding the railing each each and every time. Uh, you, I think, you know, an environment of innovation is one where you may have safety, but you don't have a railing all the time to hold on to, and that you encourage people to go from the top to the bottom, or the bottom to the top, as the case might be, in a different way. Not not endangering safety or or throwing environment to the winds. So to your to your point, I think innovation has to be the environment that you create around yourself. You have companies where just as you described, you have the guy that puts his feet up who doesn't come to the office on time, who breaks every tradition that you have that is worth his weight in gold because he can sit back and think of something which turns out to be a billion dollar uh, advantage to the company. Uh, if, if I might mention companies, Apple computers was innovative when it, when Steve Jobs first did it, but the board pushed him out because he was considered a failure and he was fired. And then the, the company brought him back as, as a CEO when it was almost bankrupt some years later and he built what today is probably the, the, most, the valuable. most valuable company in the, in the world. Uh, and what he really did was he did everything different to what the book would say. He undertook his own merchandising and marketing with his own stores. He spent his time on doing something that most people would say would fail. And he had the inner courage to continue to do that. Is that innovation or stubbornness? Uh, I, I think, again, it would work for one person and not for another. But he created an environment very autocratically that opened, opened innovativeness. And another example is Google today. Google is, is a true en environment of innovation. It, encourages uh, thoughts to happen. Google X has been created to refocus on innovative new things that, that are being done. So you can create uh, a less formal uh, environment that is very innovative. Someone has to decide that we will invest in this innovation or not. And in not doing so, not, not kill this innovation so that innovation may take another form. You may lose that person who goes out and create and pursues that innovation and it comes to the market. You want to go to work feeling that you have the freedom to innovate. You're not in a box. You're not look left, look right, and then walk forward or or have to hold on to a staircase railing to go down or you go back up. <laughs> those, those create very safe, very traditional environments. Yeah. But if the company is the company that Toyota may be, it must have some little pocket somewhere that's innovating that doesn't have that. And then the next question you ask is, why should Toyota not have that everywhere? And maybe, it. maybe it happens in some areas and not in a foreign environment where they operate. I don't know.
one of my one of my pursuits right now is to uh, try to tackle the issue of malnutrition amongst children in in India, which is proving to be a much much bigger task than I had ever assumed in terms of what it really addresses. One is trying to innovate and one is up against, do you defeat yourself in innovating because you're dealing with a very convention-based and traditional-based marketplace that is the rural market? Are they open to doing something differently? You know, it's the syndrome of, of uh, in the rural area, if you're sick, you consider that needle that goes in you that we call an injection. Sui dega to tikhoga, even if it's uh, glucose. Yeah. So there are symbols of of tradition that we have to overcome. So when you go and say whether you take this pill or you sniff this essence and it's good for you, it doesn't do what this does. For, for something like that to happen, to change the dimension of fetal and infant uh, nourishment in the country, yeah. which is very, very vital, where almost sixty percent of the rural population, even their skeletal system is not growing to its yeah. full size. In a nation like this, where we are busy producing an underdeveloped population and all that we have is population, nothing else in this country. If we make this into a strong, capable, inspired population, we could be a miracle, otherwise it would be a catastrophe in this. Unless we have an army of dedicated people on the ground who can educate and transform that situation, just trying to do something from the top, either from the government or even from a corporate sector, may not really take shape because we have been in rural India working there, so, there are many ways to do this and uh, we are already at this. But when you talk to a, a, a qualified doctor, they're always thinking in terms of putting, you know, iron pills or vitamin pills into the pregnant ladies. If necessary, yes, maybe. But to improve the diet itself in the rural India, where we have shifted from uh, what we call as subsistence farming to cash farming, where people you would eat better twenty-five years ago, but they did not live better in other terms. But today in all other terms, if you go into the village today, there's electricity, there's a bore well, they have an internet kiosk, everybody has cell phones, but their nourishment value has gone down because they don't have the mentality to use their money to go and buy the necessary food stuff, either uh, fruit, vegetable, fish or meat or whatever that is needed for them, they tend to… the staple diet in South India has become just rice, chili, onion and uh, tamarind. In North India, it's wheat, onion, chili. You, the whole country, at least in Northern India, the whole… the whole government debate is about the price of the onions. <laughs> I happened to be in London and this was going on on the news and they asked, what about the onions? So this is our staple diet. That's why everybody is discussing onion in the parliament on the street and somebody is trying to win an election on the price of the onions because that's our staple diet. Nourishment has been forgotten. So to bring back that culture of nourishment, one… You know, many ways it can be done to bring back those vegetables, fruits into people's lives, we have taken steps. Now the next step we are planning is to start fish ponds in every village. So every him, every person must consume at least one kilogram of fish per week at least and it will be available free of cost if they just throw their waste into the fish pond. So innovative ways of doing this has to happen because this is a silent disaster which is just progressing and it will overwhelm the nation at some point. You know, I, I think what you just said over the last few minutes is… is really, really relevant because what we are finding also is the worst thing you can do for the country is to give everybody a sense of dependability on an outside force, be it the government, be it a private party, be it a public-private partnership. You have to create sustainability that is self-generated. If we have to create an en environment of innovation, maybe that innovation comes 
not necessarily just in the nutritive thing, but how to create prosperity that is sustainable in a community. Mm. Uh, not prosperity that you've uh, fritter away in, in buying material things. That's the trappings of prosperity, but to create prosperity in the village. Fisheries or fish ponds or or creating uh, livelihood in in terms of produce, etc. We're not addressing those issues adequately in the country, and many of them are, as as you say, things that can easily be done. And uh, if the nutritive value of what we eat has diminished over time, it's because we have allowed it to diminish, and we have not been innovative in terms of addressing this. You need to be thinking you're doing the right thing and and you're doing the right thing for the community in which you are. Uh, if it involves doing the right thing through which you, you call CSR, then that's what you need to do. Uh, it may not be 4%, it may be a minuscule amount, but it will make a big difference in the community in which you are. It's not money related, it's not percentage of, of net profit. It may be the, the time that employees spend helping that community. Just as we said, it's not an issue of money, it's an issue of adding to the quality of life of that community that, that there may be. Uh, I don't think, just like we've talked about innovation, I don't think you can mandate CSR. You can't mandate the 2%. Two percent. Yes, I've been consistently talking. You're changing the ground rules when you say CSR 2%. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're, you're creating a tax. Yes. <laughs> It'll be viewed like a tax. It's uh, something that you have to make up in some other way. CSR has to come from within you and, and it's, you call it CSR, call it anything you want. I think it's wrong to consider it, uh, put it in a, in a box and call it CSR. It's what you think you're doing that's adding value to the community in which you are. Can you equate yourself to it, or do are you are you an in industrial company that will wipe out a village because you want to put a plant that you dig a hole because you need a dump for your industrial waste? Will you will you uh, pull down a forest because you want to do something else there, or do you need the timber that for your operations and you don't? Re regenerate that. All those things, I think, are questions you have to ask yourself. And uh, do you pollute the river, and without uh, without refining your refuge so that it doesn't uh, kill people, or do you? Is that somebody else's problem? I think. Uh, there has to be a willingness to sacrifice for the good of the community if it is called, if you're called upon to do so, called upon by yourself to do so, not mandated by law. And uh, if, for example, if you're in the asbestos business and you're, and one day asbestos turns out to be a carcinogenic product, are you willing to go out of that business? Or are you going to safeguard all the things that you think you can do or brazenly keep pushing that product into the marketplace until the law says Catches that you up. can't can't do it? Which of those things are is is moral responsibility look moral responsibility to keep people employed but that you might be endangering them, their health? putting products into the market that uh, might hurt people and cause them ill health. What, 
what is that? Where does that responsibility lie? Is it the government's responsibility to ban it? Is it yours to identify that that's what you should do? Uh, there are cigarette companies in the U.S. that will not allow people to be in, the, in on the board of that company unless they smoke. <laughs> it's true. Cigars or cigarettes. <laughs> but that's a good thing. Huh? It's a that's a good thing. Do unto yourself what you do unto others. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs>